Right, praise God. Just put your, just put your hand on your heart. And just uh, breathe in. Breathe out. <sighs> yeah, put your hand on your heart. Keep it, keep it right here. Just breathe in. We're just resting. Breathe in. Yeah, breathe out. Let's do it one more time because rest is the realm of reception. So breathe in. Breathe out. Once upon a time, I lost this heart of mine. (laughs) To the one who hung upon a tree, this God who died for me, he turned toward the dust. He lived without a lust. Raised to glory light, there is no greater sight. Now my robes are clean and I shall see the scene. The throne of God above and Christ, his son of love. Oh, thank you for kisses divine and vanished time. Rest in my mind. Greater than signs, you shimmer, you shine. You're better than wine with a heart so kind. I'm pining while mining treasures I'm finding that align me with thee while I'm dining with thee. Lord, I look up to you and I ask you to make my voice so like unto thine that even the weakest sheep will hear it and follow you. In your precious name, because in the sight of you, rubies turn to toys and emerald sordid dust. Pride is worthless noise and mansions are morbid rust. We worship you. We praise you. There is not another, not even one. I bless your name. You are worthy, my love. You are worthy, my love. Holy Spirit, I ask you to unveil the irresistible beauty of Jesus Christ. (laughs) The, The precious and holy and glorious bridegroom who shines brighter than the sun, who leaps over the mountains of division to pick us up and carry us, to lift us into himself, shining with resplendent rays of glory that blind us to everything else. I pray tonight he will be seen. Amen. I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 22. I I, uh, am asked sometimes, why do you use the same text every time you're going to preach? I can't get past this text. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. While you're turning there, I just want to tell you that I asked the Lord what to say to you tonight. You you know what he said to me? Do you want to know what he said? (laughs) The Lord spoke to my heart and he said, tell them this. Oh, how I love you. Let me count the ways. I said, Lord, what else is there to say? And he says, tell them how beautiful they are to me. And I said, oh, Lord, but would there be anything else you want to say? And he said, tell them they're the greatest delight of my heart. I said, oh, Lord, is there anything else? And he said, tell them or remind them that I desire them and they belong with me. I I can feel in my heart, like his, he just loves you so much. He's just taken with you. He knows you're standing up and you're sitting down. He watches everything you do. He's literally head over heels for you. He can't love you any more than he already does. He can't do anything more for you than he's already done. He gave every drop of his blood just to show you love before you even knew who he was or cared about him. Oh, I tell you, You're the treasure of this God of mine. And if you could see how much he loves you, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even believe it because it's too amazing. You say, Eric, me? Yes, you. But you don't know what I've done. He already died. (laughs) You can't mess it up. He already died for you. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
There isn't any greater demonstration of love that could ever be given. There's no bridegroom like the bridegroom. (laughs) The bridegroom. Every bridegroom on the earth is as inferior to the bridegroom of heaven as a shadow is to a man. It is the Christ, the Son of Man. So I, I know I share Daniel's heart when I say we are so interested in the enduring more than the immediate. And even as God has done many things here, I know many people have been touched. But I want to tell you, and I know you've heard this before, but the public touches have got to turn into private kisses. If the public touch does not turn into private kisses, then this whole thing was not accomplishing the purpose for which it was put together. The public touch must turn to a private kiss or it will all fade away. This is so important for us. I once wrote a poem after an incredible meeting with signs and wonders and miracles. I sat down in my room and I wrote, the music, it's so good and exciting when it peaks, but I prefer what I should. It's the touch of our cheeks. Silent language in secret, it's you my soul seeks. I I look to you to increase it because I know my love is weak in words. Often they're as empty as lies and I offer to you what can't be heard. An honest heart and exclusive eyes, you alone are pure. Cleanse my mind from wise. Wise. Your promises are sure even though creation slowly dies. To study alone is danger. Your nearness lifts the mud. You put yourself on paper and you gave yourself in blood. Rituals hold no anchor. I need life from above. Principles are a vapor when I can give to you my love. I'm telling you, the romance of the ages involves you and the precious, resplendent, glorious bridegroom. There isn't a love story even close. As a matter of fact, every romantic thing you've ever seen in your life was made to point you to someone who's more romantic than anything that can happen in this life. They're all small shadows of this precious God man who loves you so much. So I want to talk to you tonight about the bridegroom being living water. I want you to say this. Say the bridegroom is living water. Say it again. The bridegroom is living water. Revelation chapter twenty-two, seventeen 17 says this, the spirit and the bride say, come and let the one who hears say, come and let the one who is thirsty come and let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Are you seeing this? This is where everything is headed. This is the last time the church, us, we are ever mentioned in the Bible and we are described as a bride. A bride means you recognize his place as bridegroom. A bride means that your heart has love for him. A bride means you've left everything else, all other comfort, comforts, all other pursuits, all other desires to find all that now in him. Bride means the loss of self in another. The Bible says the, the, the two shall no longer be two, but one. It's the loss of yourself in another. That's a bride. And we see here, this is where it's all headed. And we see that it says the spirit and the bride say come. So the spirit has worked out of the bride all other longings and all other loves. So much so they have one thing on their heart. You come. It's you that I desire. I am reaching out yearning for you. That's the work of the spirit in the human heart. So now the purified and united bride with the spirit has this cry. Come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. This cry on the inside to have you in a greater way than I can hear. That's the cry of the bride. And I want to encourage you that without this burning Maranatha inside of our blood, we're missing the point. He's coming and he's coming to swoop us up in his arms. See, the spirit has worked 
in the bride's heart so much that he has planted her in the person of Christ. And that has uprooted her from everything else in this life. I want you to say this. Say, Jesus, I want to be planted in you so much so that I'm uprooted from everything in this life. You notice here that it says the spirit and the bride say come and let the one who hears say come and let the one who is thirsty say come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. This is referencing something specific. It's actually in Isaiah chapter 55 where we can use the scripture to expound on what's being said by seeing another part of scripture. Scripture interprets scripture. And when you see the bride connected to drinking, you can go to Isaiah 55 and you can see this. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, let him come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Are you seeing this? This is a satisfaction issue. And the only requirement for this satisfaction is thirst. Thirst is the recognition of your need. Lord, I realize I do not have in and of myself what I need, so I look to you as the only one who can give it to me. That's thirst. The Bible promises in Luke eleven thirteen that if you ask, you will receive. And the Father gives the Holy Spirit to whoever asks. To ask means you recognize you do not have, and you recognize you need, and you recognize he's the only one that can do it for you. It's absolute bankruptcy. And I'm telling you right now, dependency and poverty is the currency of experiencing the living water. You know, if you pour water into a cup, the water rushes down to the bottom and it fills it up immediately, does it not? That's what it does. It rushes in to fill the lowest place. And so it is with the Holy Spirit. He rushes in to fill those who are dependent and low before him. I tell you right now, those that are dry are too high. <laughs> there, there, isn't, there isn't a place for dryness. There isn't a place for dryness because we're the bride and the bride drinks. So he fills the low. Actually, in Isaiah chapter 41 Verse 17, you see this, to the afflicted, the, to the needy, seeking water, but they cannot find none. I, the Lord, will answer them myself. God takes it upon himself to satisfy the thirsty. And it goes on, as the God of Israel, I will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the barren heights and springs in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry ground fountains of water. He promises to be gushing out and over upon you. This is what the bride does. The bride recognizes that the groom himself is the satisfier of the soul. She recognizes that the bridegroom is living water. And this is very important. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 7, verse 38, we see the bridegroom stand up at a feast. Christ, the bridegroom, stands up. And you know what he says? The wonderful bridegroom stands up, verse 37, 38 of chapter 7 of John. He says this. He says, anyone who's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. You see, the bridegroom is labeling himself as water, that which satisfies. I am that which satisfies the soul. Christ himself. So what is this water that the bride drinks? It is the receiving of the bridegroom himself. What an imagery that God would put himself in something that we recognize to be imbibed. Something that we recognize to constantly come into us and quench our thirst. He chose this imagery, not us. Trying to tell us that he longs to be that thing we receive to satisfy our souls. Psalm 107 tells us that he fulfills all the longings of the soul. If you remember in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 2, God says, I remember when you loved me like a bride. 
And then in 17, he says, my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living water. And they've hewn out for themselves cisterns, cisterns that cannot even hold water. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say there's a connection between the bride that they used to be and the, the water that comes forth gushing from the fountain of life. The bride drinks. And the bride that doesn't have satisfaction in Christ has ceased to be, quote, the bride. Because that's what she is. Did you know it's an evil thing not to drink the Lord? My people have committed two evils. What is it? They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewn out for themselves other things to be satisfied with. If our Christianity is without satisfaction, we know by that we've placed a method over a man. If our Christianity is not a drinking in of satisfaction, we know we've replaced the person of Christ with principles. If we are not the satisfied bride, that means we value our idea of God more than God himself. He's alive and he's real and he does quench the thirst. This is what he does. The fact that he's called living water is beautiful because living means he's alive. Water means he quenches your thirst. This is who the bridegroom is. I, can't, I, I don't understand people who talk about dryness when he is the living water. This is the gospel gushing up out fountains in the midst of the valleys. This is it in the wilderness, a pool of water. He is the quenching of the thirst. The bridegroom satisfies his bride. Listen, satisfaction, guys, is not a side issue. Satisfaction is the very means by which God frees us and enables us to be able to obey him. He shuts up, he stops all the longings of the soul with himself. I'm telling you right now, many people live their lives unsatisfied with God, not realizing that they're testifying to the world that he's not a bridegroom by doing that. If they live, we live unsatisfied with God, we're telling the world Jesus is not enough. We replace the gospel of the all-sufficient person of Christ and we reduce it to just a system of beliefs that can't actually be something you drink. I don't know, last time you looked at a, a, an actual contract, but you can't drink a contract. We don't sign on the dotted line saying this is now what we believe and drink that piece of paper. It, it doesn't work. Christ himself alone has made himself edible. He's made himself imbibable because he wants to be on the inside. I feel in my heart that this is so important for us because if we're going to be the bride, if we are the bride, the bride has this distinguishing mark. She is satisfied with her, her bridegroom. She finds all sufficiency in him. A.W. Tozer said the tragedy of the church is that from childhood to old age, men have only known a synthetic God compounded of theology and logic, having no eyes to see nor ears to hear. But that's not what we're going to be because in our hearts, we look to the person of the Lord to be satisfaction for us. How long will we seek substance in the land of shadows? How long will we spend money for that which is not bread? That cannot be satisfied. We cannot find satisfaction in anything here below. Religion drains us. Health even flies away. Wealth makes itself wings. Honor's just the breath of men's mouths and pleasures are bubbles. Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone is pleasure forevermore. Yes, I mean him who is the lily of the valleys, the purest of all gold, the rose of Sharon, the chiefest among 10,000. He who is fairer than all the sons of men. He who is altogether lovely and is wholly desirable. I encourage you to seek the bliss that never goes away. I encourage you that this is what the Christian life actually looks like. See, he can, his, his kiss comes in, as you know, Song of Solomon. She says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. In other words, I yield to your intimate, direct, loving contact by the Spirit repeatedly. Kiss me and kiss me and kiss me. See, his kiss can cure your evil and bring you to his bliss and give you him for whom you sigh. Jesus, your sweetness. See, his kiss will kill competition. His kiss will kill condemnation. His kiss will kill comparison. And you'll be free. I'm telling you, when people come to me for counsel, most of the time I ask them, when was your last kiss? 
I'm telling you, a kiss can solve the issues. He plants kisses on your soul like seeds, the bloom and blossom of which is the fruit of the Spirit. Eric, I'm trying to work on my love. Forget about love. Get kissed. I'm just, I'm right now, I'm working on my patience. Throw patience out, be kissed, and he will be patience in you. He'll sow these seeds of his person in you, and the bloom and blossom of them will be his own nature. See, his kiss lifts us out of ourselves, and then we become dead men raised by the sweetness of his mouth. Praise God. This is what I long for. Say, Eric, look at the world right now. What's happening? Listen, dead men don't suffer from climate changes. <laughs> Oh, man. I'm telling you, there's a holy complacency. And I did say complacency. And it's a holy complacency. And it looks like this. You are here. What more could I want? It looks like this. Thou hast given thyself to me. For what more could I even ask you? I have in you all things that I'm looking for. You are the fulfillment of all desires. Many people are unable to experience God because they're still clinging on to something they want from him. It's better just to forget all the stuff that God can do and just look at God. Some of us are trying so hard to get God to look at something and we don't even look at God. Jason Upton said, I get so thirsty trying to find your presence that I forgot to, to just stop and take a drink. Just drink. Those that are satisfied, these are the ones that are led by God because they're freed from the need to have anything else. What's stopping you from being led is you want something more than him. <laughs> you see, you got to get fed before you're led. You're looking for a leading and you forget the feeding. Praise God. The bridegroom gives himself to us as the all-sufficient drink. And when the eyes of the soul looking out meet the eyes of God looking in, as Tozer says, heaven has begun now upon the earth. John Owen said, if Jesus is not heaven for you now, he shall not be hereafter. Oh, he is heaven it, itself. See, you can live down here as they do up there if you do down here what they do up there. And that's a look at the Lamb of God. John the Baptist teaches us what ministry looks like. He looks at the Lamb and then he calls everyone else to do the same thing. The essence of ministry is right there. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. <laughs> Jesus. So with this, this place of drinking in the Lord, looking at your bridegroom to be everything for you, you begin to say things like this. With you, I just need nothing. I'm not even looking for answers or explanations direction even my provisions are not even con even a concern here some of you know exactly what i'm talking about when you've been lifted literally r-a-p-t wrapped in the bliss of his person this is the bride's life does she stay there all the time she's learning to eric are you always there i'm trying to learn how do you do it lower still my friend lower still with you, there's nothing I'm even needing. I find everything in you. True peace, trust, and joy, and satisfaction. All my internals are fulfilled. You know what I'm talking about, those of you that are brides drinking from the bridegroom. And those of you that do not know what I'm talking about, this is what it's all about right here. I have everything in you, Lord, content with your kiss and your countenance. And my only gift I can give to you is this black, wicked, dark, wounded heart. But you love it so much. Why? I do not know. You love us for no reason. I love you for many. That's the key. My heart is in this place of satisfaction. I feel like there's nothing else I even want to do. I feel like in looking at him, I'm doing all that I ever want to do. And all that I desire is more of the same. Do you know what I'm talking about? Is this what you feel? Is this the reality of Christ? That you've drank the living water. You have found the sweet bridegroom who is this. And I tell you, when you're needless, his seeds get into your soul. It's all the neediness that blocks the seeds from getting in on the inside. 
But when you're needless, the selfishness, the self-life, the self-significance, the self-gratification, all these things are seen to be completely unnecessary. Is it not true? No more searching or seeking for this, that, and the other. It seems as if nothing else exists. It's almost like when the glory of God, like a cloud, fills the temple, the only thing that can be seen is the cloud. That's very much what it's like when we come into the manifest presence of the Lord. He blinds you to everything else but himself. It's just him saying, this is my glory. You're looking only at me. <laughs> I'm taking all your vision. It's interesting that McShane once wrote, in one of his letters, he says, if we are the temple of God, then we are in type and shadow, heaven itself. What does that mean? It means here, now, him can be experienced and enjoyed. Vanities vanish, and it seems as if life itself is transcended. And you begin to see in your heart that refusing to sin is far inferior to refusing to depart from his presence. It becomes no longer about what you can do and what you can't do. And, and everything has to do with eating now and drinking. <laughs> it's a feast. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, is like a feast. Sit down, relax, and drink and eat. And as you do this, he will work his incredible work inside of the heart and uproot you from this world and plant you in himself. You see, everything compared to him disappears. And though he does give many things to us in his kindness, it's almost as if though we, ha we have things, they're transient or they're, they're transparent or even subjugated to you. They don't have power over you. You know, David had been showered by God with a million gifts without because God knew he only wanted one thing within. It's this wonderful key. And you find as you take time to Drink of the bridegroom and enjoy the sweetness of his person. You close your eyes and you see streams that glisten with the light of his face on the inside of you. This is life in the, in the bridal relationship. The bridegroom is living water. This is who he is to you. In John chapter 4, I just want to close out with this, this section here. This blew me away the other day when I was reading it, thinking of Jesus Christ as the bridegroom and the living water. And it says here that Jesus got tired in his journey in the fifth verse here. And then it says here that he went to Jacob's well. Did you hear what I just said? He went to Jacob's well, wearied from his journey. Now, when you see the, the word well, that should spark your attention about something. The bridegroom is at a well. The bridegroom is at a well. If you've read your Bible, something should start popping up in your mind. You know Moses met Zipporah, his wife, at a well. Abraham sends his servant out to find a bride for his son, and the servant finds Rebekah at a well. Jesus is at Jacob's well. Jacob met his wife at a well. The bridegroom is at a well. This means we can see something is being said here more than what's actually going on. And it's Jesus looking for a bride. And here he is looking for this bride. And look at what he says. He turns to her and he goes, give me a drink. Oh, that's funny. That's what Jacob said to Rachel. Same words. Jesus is looking for a bride. He's looking for one who will love him and give unto him everything, all of it. Take it all, Lord Jesus. And it says here that as he's there talking with her, look at what he tells her. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would ask me and I'd give you living water. The bridegroom is living water. And he, the bridegroom at the well, looks at her and says, let me be all your satisfaction. Because if you drink of me, he actually goes on. And what does he say? He says, if you drink of me, the drink that you drink, this water will become inside of you a well of water. It springs up to eternal life. This is life itself. It shows us that it's not just drinking one time that satiates a man. It's actually the drink installs in him the ability to always be satisfied. In other words, it's not like I drank the Lord one time, I will never thirst again. It's like this. I drink the Lord and now he's on the inside and I can drink from him whenever I wish. You're dry? You forgot you have a well on the inside. <laughs> Eric, Eric, but you don't understand my situation. No, whatever you're going through doesn't trump the bridegroom and what he's already done for you. 
Don't try to put what you're going through above Jesus and what he said. Okay, let's not do that. That's not good. I don't want to be that guy. So we see Song of Solomon chapter 4, verse 15. You know what the wonderful bridegroom says to his bride? Guys, listen to this. He looks at his bride and he calls her a well of living water. In other words, the bride is the one who has drank him who is living water, found all her satisfaction in him, and he has set up his home in her body. This is what happened to you when you were born again. You drank. There's a well in you. And it's time for, to never let another day go by where you do not drink deep of his love and drink deep of the wonderful satisfactions there are in him, the holy bridegroom has given his endless, limitless self as an installed well of living water. I'm telling you, you can be green in every scene of life. There's no reason to ever be dry because you have God on the inside. So the bride should be the most satisfied, joy-satiated, peace-stilled, selfless thing the world has ever seen because she has a bridegroom. You want to see this, something else that's really kind of interesting in here? John chapter 4 for me. You know what Jesus says to her? The bridegroom at the well looking for a bride, offering himself as living water to her. You know what he says to her? Where's your husband? <laughs> he said, where's your husband? Let's get to your problem. Where's your husband? In other words... She says, I have no husband. He goes, exactly, that's your problem. You ain't got no husband. <laughs> Eric, I got all these problems in your life. Well, you need to marry Jesus. Your problem is you ain't got no husband. <laughs> okay, so Jesus says to her, she says, I, you know, I don't have a husband. Then he says, you're right, you've had five husbands. This is indicative of trying to search the world for something only Jesus can be. <laughs> Only Jesus can satisfy the soul. Period. <laughs> Hallelujah. I thank you, Father, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned, and you've revealed them to infants and babes. Praise you, Jesus. From the lips of infants and sucklings, you have established praise and strength. You're glorious. I bless you, Lord. So I'm going to close out here. Two minutes. Can I have two more minutes? <laughs> Guys, I'm having so much fun up here. Listen, Richard Warmbr, somebody may be saying right now, you know, Eric, you just don't know my life situation. <clears throat> and I've already addressed that. But let me just give you a little situation to kind of destroy any kind of arguments against Jesus being able to be drank anytime, anyplace, anywhere, satisfy your soul all the time, okay? Richard Wormbrand, if you don't know who he, was, who he was, he was a Romanian pastor that was put in prison for 14 years for preaching the gospel. Seven of those years, he was in solitary confinement. Fed one slice of bread a week, dying slowly. He said he forgot what colors were. He hadn't heard a woman's voice in 14 years, a child in 14 years. He said he couldn't even remember prayers to pray because he was so worn out and tired many times he would try to say the lord's prayer and he would just say jesus i love you jesus i love you when he comes out of prison they asked him how his time was and they said to him you must have been in hell and then he says oh no hell is to be without the presence of jesus they asked him they said what was it like was it was it was it a terrible situation well, what talk to us and he says this we knew his caresses and his holy kisses. It was the most beautiful time of my life. You say, Eric, what kind of Christianity is that? That's called bridegroom living water Christianity. <laughs> Eric, there's so many things going on in the world. Listen, there's a bridegroom that will be the satisfaction to all your needs. He will fulfill every desire. He'll lift you above the earth and you can be here and simultaneously wrapped up in the bliss of his person. Spurgeon said this, since the way to heaven is heavenly and the road to bliss is bliss, who will not follow Jesus? 
He says, my soul, be thou in love with the way as well as the end, since Jesus is both one as well as the other. So you say, Eric, how are you going to close this message out? What are you trying to say? My conclusion is this, that Jesus looks at you tonight and he says this, marry me. He says, marry me, let me be all to thee. None can be what I can be. Give ears to hear and eyes to see. Thrill your soul with ecstasy and fill your heart with joy and peace and make internal wars to cease and lift you above life's miseries and take you into my victories. Love you now and endlessly marry you eternally. Myself, I present to you as one sent to you, mocked and rent for you, blood spent for you, death sentenced to cross, shame and grave. Oh, let me save you again. Only I can mend through the spirit I send so come to me and be one with me unto me live and give your soul and you'll behold and you'll know my father are there any others with an affection greater than mothers and deeper than lovers I'll smother your sins away I'll cover you with my pinions and lay you on my chest with a quieted rest I'll end all your quests stilled and caressed oh I'm the best for you victory through making you new by a love you've never known with a substance I alone am for I am the son of man this is what I feel God is saying to you tonight. That you would be, you would be wrapped in his glory. Just, just turn your heart to him real quick. We're, we're ending right here. Just turn your heart to him and begin to tell him, Oh Lord, be living water for me. Be living water for me, Jesus. Be living water for me. I praise you. I praise you. Just open your mouth. Begin to worship him right there. I praise you. I worship you. I worship you. Praise you. Glory and honor to your name. I bless you. I bless you, Jesus. Yeah, just open your mouth. Just let, just let love come out and rise to him. Let love come out and rise to him. Let love rise from your heart. Oh, how I love you. Oh, how I love you. Oh, how I long for you. Come and change my heart, oh God. Oh. Bless you. Bless you. I praise you. Yeah, open your mouth. Just worship him. Oh, how I love you. I love you. Arashandra, you say. My beloved. It's the most beautiful among thousands and thousands. My beloved is the most beautiful among thousands and thousands my beloved is the most yeah open your mouth and sing among thousands my beloved, my beloved is. Come on, open your mouth and sing. Among thousands. My beloved is the most beautiful. Among thousands. And thousands, Yeshua, 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 